regarding this system here, it is quite user friendly. So if you have any problem, you have all have to contact one of the very helpful secretaries, and they're extremely helpful. So I don't know much about the system here because I'm not from here. So, but they are very helpful. So you can start with the academic program or first big Professor Bruno Krigna. Yeah, so uh, tame topology uh, was introduced. The word appeared uh, in Grotendieck, in fact, in uh, Recolt SMI, and then in Esquisse uh, d'un programme. Just give you the reference if you want to have a look at it. So, um, what is the main idea is there? Uh, the idea of Grotendieck is that he's claiming that uh, anal analysis and uh, topology were developed for the, for, for the needs of analysts, but not really for understanding uh, forms in, uh, in geometry. So, uh, general topology, if you just want to use it uh, for geometry, should be replaced by some tame topology, where you consider only uh, topological properties of classical geometric objects. And uh, this idea was uh, continued by uh, model theorists, so logicians. And uh, this idea of tame topology uh, was developed under the name of O-minimality. OK, so uh, what is the goal uh, of the talk? So today, uh, I want to give you basics about tame topology. So, O minimality. So, basic definitions and uh, applications and general applications. To um, complex geometry. And uh, the goal of tomorrow will be to uh, give more applications uh, to Hodge theory. Okay. Is it big enough? Everybody can see? Yeah. Okay, so um, let me start with... Uh, uh, tame topology. So the lecture today will be really basic. It's more an exposition that, than really a research talk. But I think these, these are very interesting and kind of very simple ideas that have to be known, so I'll try to uh, explain them. So, uh, So what is the first point? Uh, the first point is uh, to give a rough idea, intuition of what we mean by tame. So uh, let's say what are the forms, what are the general topological properties that the geometer does not want to see? Uh, Um, well, of course, you can think of, uh, of very basic things that uh, you learn uh, when you are young, like Cantor sets, or uh, space filling curves. And then for the classical geometers, those things are patho pathologies that you don't want to really consider, at least for me. <laughs> Uh, but in fact, uh, the idea of tame topology deals with much more even basic phenomena. So let me consider the following example. So more basically, and I think in some sense in this example, you see exactly uh, the things that should not exist for the geometer. So you consider the graph. So this is a graph of the function that to x associate uh, sinus 1 over x. But as I should say is that um, this topology, everything will be over R. Right? This, is, this is really a pure theory. The O is for ordering. So you use in a crucial way the fact that uh, R is, a, uh, is an ordered field. Yeah, so this, these are really uh, real phenomena. 
and that you want to study. So the, the pathological example, so by gamma I denote the graph of a function, and the function you consider is just sinus 1 over x for x a real positive number. Okay, and then I claim that, uh, so this is inside R2, and the claim is that uh, this set is pathological for, uh, for the geometer. And what are the main features of, uh, of that set? Well, first you can look at the closure of that guy. And as it was known, this is an oscillating function close to zero, so you get exactly gamma union a segment which is 0, 1 and 0, minus 1. This vertical segment, okay? And uh, now what are the pathological features of this? So gamma is not tame for at least two reasons. Two reasons. The first one is uh, look at the dimension of the uh, boundary. So of gamma bar minus gamma. So this is the dimension of this segment. And so this is one. And so this is the same thing as the dimension of gamma. So for a geometer, this kind of object should not exist because then you cannot make any stratification theory, for example. Okay? And then the second thing is that, well, a gamma bar, as is well known, is connected, but not arcwise connected. If you consider that geometry is basically drawing, then of course this is not a very good property. Okay, so uh, this is to give you a feeling of what we don't want, and uh, what do we want? Well, uh, the idea of O-minimality is to, count, to give you axiomatically the properties that uh, you allow uh, when you study geometry. So the prototype of tame geometry topology uh, will be uh, semi-algebraic geometry. This is really the prototype. So let's try to study first the property of uh, semi-algebraic geometry and then we'll axiomatize what we want. So uh, just recall uh, the following definition. What is a semi-algebraic set in Rn? Well, it's semi-algebraic. Uh, if it is of the form, uh, the set of zeros uh, of a polynomial and also uh, satisfying some uh, inequalities. Uh, for some um, polynomials in n variables. So these are just the subset of Rn defined by a Boolean a combination of uh, polynomial equalities and inequalities. So uh, what are the tame properties? Of those sets, well, there are some uh, basic facts. That if x is semi-algebraic, uh, then this implies that x bar and x bar minus x are semi-algebraic, and uh, that the dimension of x bar minus x is strictly smaller than uh, the dimension of x. Okay, so uh, this feature does not occur for semi-algebraic sets. Then uh, a second thing is that uh, any connected component uh, of a semi-algebraic set is semi-algebraic. Yeah, so I'm very vague about the dimension. I would give a more precise definition in the axiomatic setting uh, later. The intuition, intuitive notion uh, can take out of dimension if you want. It's all, it also works. But yes, yes. Okay, so um, any connected component of a semi-algebraic set is semi-algebraic. And uh, if you take the number of connected components of a semi-algebraic set, then uh, this is finite. 
So uh, another feature is that it has nice stratification theory. In other words, if, if I give you a semi-algebraic set, and I can stratify it by semi-algebraic subsets, which are also uh, manifolds. And uh, another property which is crucial if you want to uh, study families is it's that uh, you have only finitely many uh, topological types uh, in semi-algebraic families. Right, so if you take a semi-algebraic set, fiber of another semi-algebraic set by a semi-algebraic map, then if you look at the fibers, then you will get only finitely many uh, topological types. Okay, of course, uh, so this is, this is a prototype, but this is not what we want to do, because in some sense, everything you are doing here is real algebraic geometry. Okay, there are some inequalities, but it's too close to algebraic geometry. And the goal is to get out of the world of algebraic geometry and still keep uh, nice topological properties. And so uh, what we do is that uh, we'll uh, just axiomatize the properties of those sets. So uh, the first thing that I want to uh, introduce is the notion of structure in the sense of uh, logicians. So don't be, don't be frightened. I know nothing about model theory. So I don't know if you know, but at least I don't know. But you don't need it in some sense. It's just the language. So uh, what is a structure? Well, a structure in the sense of uh, model theory uh, in our setting, so extending R is a collection. It's just the rules that gives you the sets, the subsets of R you are allowed to play with. So it's a collection curved S, Sn, or N in N, such that Sn is a subset of the power set of Rn. So it's a collection of subset of Rn. Satisfying uh, some axioms. So first, you want that uh, the algebraic sets. Sorry? No. The same N. Sn, this is a subset of the power, power set of Rn. Yeah, it's the same n. It's not a mistake. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so in each dimension, you will give yourself the subset of Rn you are allowed to play with. Okay. So you want the algebraic sets to be uh, in Sn. Uh, second is that. You want Sn to be a Boolean subalgebra. Which means simply that uh, this is stable under uh, finite intersection, finite unions, and complement. Okay? So each time you have two sets in Sn, and uh, its intersection is also in Sn, the union is in Sn, and the complement of any of those sets is in Sn. Third, you want uh, this structure to be stable by product. So uh, if A is in SP and B is in SQ, then this implies that the set A times B is in SP plus Q. Okay, so these are very innocuous axioms. Now come a very important axiom. Maybe I will write it uh, there. Is that you want the structure to be stable by linear projection. So uh, if P is a projection from Rn plus 1 to Rn, is a linear map, uh, and A is in Sn plus 1, then this implies that P of A is in Sn. So, sorry. Okay. So if you think, so of course, a basic example of structure is a collection of semi-algebraic sets. And here, the axiom 4 is really, uh, it's a theorem, it's tarski seidenberg theorem in real uh, algebraic geometry. That tells you that if you take a linear projection of a semi-algebraic set, set, then it is semi-algebraic. Okay?
Yes, it will be. So, yes. So, uh, so the elements of SN uh, are, are, are called the S definable. So, S definable subsets of Rn. So, these are the only subsets of Rn you are allowed to play with. And uh, now, once you have uh, the objects, then you have the map. So a map, suppose you have a map between two uh, S-definable sets. Then you say that the map is S-definable if its graph is a definable set. Right, so A is in some RP, B is in some RQ, A times B is RP plus Q, and you're asking that the graph itself is uh, definable. Okay, so, uh, so this notion of structure is just a way of, uh, a convenient general way of defining the family of sets you are, you are allowed to play with in your geometry. So a typical example, is a semi-algebraic sets form a structure which is denoted uh, by S is equal R algebraic. Okay. Um, okay, so now some facts only with these uh, stupid axioms. Uh, facts and in fact, I should rather is to prove that uh, with this very simple axiom, if A is S definable, then this implies that uh, A bar, uh, the interior of A and the boundary of A uh, are S definable. Second is that the image and pre-image of an S-definable map are S-definable. And that the composition of S-definable maps is S-definable. So it's basic uh, set theory using those axioms. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's, I suggest you to try to, to prove, for example, that A is S definable implies that A bar is S definable. So if you do this exercise, I don't really have time to do it. It's not very uh, complicated, but it's a good exercise. You will see that basically you will have to uh, use the fact that you can define your sets in terms of projections coming from obviously semi-algebraic sets. So you will really use uh, this axiom four. And uh, essentially, what you will see is that stability and the projection uh, correspond to the fact that you can uh, eliminate quantifiers. Right, if you take the usual definition of what is a closure, this is a set of X such that for any epsilon larger than zero, there exists a point in your set you are close to, right? And uh, these axioms about projection, it's a way of getting rid of this for every epsilon that exists. Me, nation of quantifiers. Uh, okay, I will come. I, I won't have time to come to this, but in fact, the, what is crucial of working over R is the fact that the, the field is ordered. So the O in O minimality will come from uh, this. So at that point, I should say that, uh, and this is where, in some sense, logic enters the picture, is that uh, you can give another presentation. Here I gave presentation in terms of projections. But then uh, what you can do is that you can define uh, uh, the language 
associated to uh, your structure, and then see, say that the S definable sets are uh, the set defined by first order uh, formula. Okay. Uh, are the sets uh, of the form phi of x1, xn, where phi is the first order formula in the language of S. Uh, okay, so I, if I had more time, I would develop this point, but it's just to say that it's very painful to write everything in terms of projections. In principle, of course, this can be done, but a much easier way is to say that there is a certain language that you are allowed to use, and that the definable sets are essentially the, the sets defined by first order formula in that language. Okay. I don't want to say more about this. Okay, so maybe I'll give you the... Okay. Maybe it's e easier to spend some time doing it. So, so example, you take A in Rn, which is S definable, and you want to prove that A bar is S definable. So you write the usual definition of A bar. So this is a set of X in Rn, so that for any epsilon R in R, uh, epsilon positive, there exists Y in Rn, uh, Y in A, uh, such that uh, you take the usual distance, which is a semi-algebraic function, and this is crucial. Let's write it this way. Right? So I'm just saying that the, the closure of A is a set of points such that there exists, for any epsilon, there exists a point in A at distance at most epsilon from that point. Okay? So now what I claim is that this thing, you can write it as follows. You can write it as being Rn minus a projection from n plus one variable to n variables of So I'm just saying that uh, I will illustrate this. So you see here I will write the set A bar in terms of projections by a complicated, uh, not so easy formula. And what I'm saying is that uh, what this uh, amount to is to eliminate these quantifiers. But once you are at that step, uh, it's much more convenient to uh, develop the notion of uh, language associated to your structure and say that the definable sets are the sets defined by first order formula in this language. Okay, I should. I didn't, I didn't want to develop it. I don't, I don't want to, it will not be needed for today. Okay, so the, the question is what are the projections? So let me write B. B is Rn cross R cross A. So it's a good exercise to check that it works. Um, and Pn plus one of x epsilon is x, this is the first a projection, and p2 n plus 1, uh, n plus 1 of x epsilon y is x epsilon. So you see that b uh, is uh, definable, because this is a product of definable sets. Uh, this one is semi-algebraic, so it is definable in any uh, structure, and I'm using only projections. And so this guy is definable. And you see that this whole of projections is ready to kill these existential quantifiers, universal quantifiers. Um, okay. So uh, this was the, the definition of a structure. Now, uh, not every structure is of interest, uh, basically uh, because of this axiom four that you are stable under projections. So I didn't define yet uh, the tame condition. So now, uh, how many more structures? You see, the problem is with a structure, this axiom four, 
it tells you that if I add a set in dimension n plus 1, then it will create a lot of new definable sets in dimension n, n minus 1, n minus 2, and so on. And so if you take randomly your sets, at the end, you will be completely unable to do geometry. It will be purely set theory. Because at some point in dimension 0, you will get counter sets. If you are not very careful about the sets that you are adding. Okay, so the idea is to balance this axiom 4 by another axiom where that will force the sets to be nice. So this is the following uh, definition. A structure S is O minimum if you have one more axiom, axiom, which is this axiom 5, that any element of S1 is semi-algebraic. So in other words, in dimension uh, 1, you have only a finite union of points and interval. So this is the tension between this axiom 4 that creates a lot of new uh, uh, definable sets each time I add a definable set in dimension n, and this axiom 5 that tells you that nevertheless I want to keep only finite union of points and uh, intervals in dimension 1 that will make his interest of this. And so, uh, well, example. So I will come to that in a second when I give example. Semi-analytic sets will satisfy 1, 2, to 4, but not 5. So R alg is an omnium structure. And this is a prototype. So there are some remarks, and the first remark, which is of interest, is that Z is never definable in any minimal structure. So you see this is kind of strange, because I'm claiming that, uh, tomorrow we'll see that, you can study even arithmetic geometry using this kind of language, even if the basic object like Z is not definable in that. Uh, setting. Um, and so exactly for the same reasons, uh, periodic functions are never definable. Are not definable in any minimal structure. Right? Because then the kernel would have to be a definable uh, subset, but then uh, this will be basically Z. At least you will have copies of Z inside. Okay, so uh, now that I've given the definition some properties, so from now on, S will be a, an O minimal structure. And definable will mean. Uh, as definable. Okay. Okay, so let me give basic properties. So if I had more time, I could prove all of them, and all the proofs are kind of elementary analysis. But I want to give you just some feelings. So I will state the main results in the theory. Uh, the first one is completely instrumental, and this is called uh, the monotonicity theorem. Mo monotonicity theorem. So basically, it completely describes what are the definable maps if you start uh, with value in R, or from R to R, let's say from an interval to R. So uh, what does it say? It tells you the following. Suppose that you have, you have a nominal structure, any one, and you take a definable map. Okay. I fix a uh, positive integer, uh, non-negative. Uh, uh, then 
the claim is that there exists a partition of R into a points and interval such that in restriction to uh, any of these intervals of the map F uh, is uh, CP. So piece time continuously uh, differentiable. And either constant or strictly monotonous. So the basic fact that you don't have any periodic function tells, uh, is transferred in a much, much stronger statement. It tells you that you will always have this kind of finite partition such that on each interval, in, on each interval either your function is constant or it is strictly monotonous. And moreover, you can always, if you fix P, then you can always find an adapted partition for that P such that you are CP on uh, those intervals. Notice that P is finite. I cannot put infinity in this statement. And of course, uh, monotonicity refers to this very strong uh, property. So you see that those functions are very nice and uh, kind and nothing bad. So you can try to prove this theorem. The first step is to prove that uh, the set of points where F is discontinuous is definable. And then it's kind of obvious that it will be a finite union of points, and those, this will be those points. This is the first step in the proof. So uh, the second, uh, this, this uh, theorem is uh, crucial for proving the central topological result. So to define it, uh, I will give a long definition, but in fact, it's very simple. So uh, I fix P an integer. And I will define a nice uh, cellular decomposition of Rn, so a cylindrical uh, definable cellular decomposition. So let me call it CDCD. So P CDCD. So a P. I put an index P of Rn. Uh, is the following. This is a finite partition of Rn into definable cells uh, defined inductively as follows. Defined inductively as follows. So if you're in dimension one, well, uh, it's obvious. It's just you give yourself a finite collection as before, A1, AK inside R. And what are the definable cells? Well, the cells are just, on the one hand, the set, uh, the singletons AI, and the open interval AI, AI, and so on. So to give a meaning to this, uh, of course, you have only finitely many intervals, but uh, they can be unbounded. So A0 is minus infinity, and AL plus 1 is plus infinity, right? So the CDCD of R1 is just you fix A0, A1 up to AK, and then the cells are the points and the interval between the points. So it's completely trivial. Uh, this is for starting the induction, and then in higher dimension, so if n is uh, strictly larger than 1, well, what you do is you give yourself a PCDCD uh, of R n minus 1. And uh, FC1, and for every cell, uh, let's call it C, uh, of Rn minus 1, 
You give yourself uh, a certain finite number of functions. So functions from C to uh, R. So uh, such that uh, these ones are uh, CP and definable. Right, so in dimension one, you don't see uh, this integer p. If you want, you can just put p equal to zero. It's not very important for what we do. It's just we want to define the level of differentiability of the boundaries of your cells. That's all. Where, where, what? Well, in all the examples that I know, you can put p is equal to infinity, but. I mean, uh, it's like in the real semi-algebraic geometry, if you want to make the difference between Nash manifolds and some, some stuff is not Nash, but. So uh, the way you define now uh, your new cells in dimension N, new cells are given by uh, the graph of, uh, uh, of uh, F uh, of those functions and the strips So let me make a picture, it will be completely clear. So it's kind of a very simple uh, notion of uh, cell decomposition. So suppose, suppose I'm in dimension two. So uh, I have a cell decomposition of R, I have a finite number of points, I put uh, these points. Then this is a cell. On that cell, I fix a function which is CP on it, and another function, right? And I'm above at that point, so uh, this will be a cell. This will be a cell, and so on. Okay. Yes. So this is one cell. This is one cell. This is one cell. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you give yourself this kind of decomposition of R n by induction on the dimension. And uh, what is the, the main topological uh, theorem is called the decomposition theorem. It tells you that if you give yourself uh, a finite number of definable subsets of Rn, so I'll recall that I fixed the S definable as uh, the O minimal structure I'm working with, then uh, there exist, there always exist. Uh, whatever, and you fix yourself P, then there exists a, a, such a decomposition of Rn such that each Ai is a union of cell. So it's a very strong theorem. It tells you that if you have finitely many definable sets in Rn, then you can find a, a very simple partition of Rn of this form, so that uh, any of those uh, definable set is a, a union of cells. So the immediate corollaries of this, yeah, because uh, anyway, uh, as I said, the partition itself has only finitely many cells. Because in dimension one, the cells, you have this finite number of intervals, and the functions are definable, so uh, up, upstairs also you have only finitely. So the decomposition is really trivial, I mean, you have only finitely many cells in all this business. The corollary is that uh, each definable set, set uh, has a finite number of connected components. Because, well, you just look at those cells and the way they are glued together, and so you see that you have only finitely many possibilities, uh, connected components, and uh, obviously, which are definable. So you recover the properties that we had for semi algebraic sets. The second is that you have the tam tameless properties that you wanted. Uh, can, you, can you read here? Maybe I will continue uh, there. 
Second is that you have the crucial property uh, that uh, the dimension of a bar minus a for a definable is strictly smaller than dimension. And here you have a nice notion of dimension where dimension is sub of uh, dimension of cells. So of course, th there are many ways of uh, getting such decomposition. There is not a unique one. But you can, uh, you can prove that this notion of dimension, the sub of dimension of cell, uh, is well defined. So already we have uh, this uh, tameless property. Then uh, what are the other uh, theorems that are nice? You have a nice stratification theorem. Tells you that if you have A in R n uh, definable and P in n, then uh, there exists a partition in a finite number of strata where a stratum is a CP manifold, I have fixed P, oh, yes, is a CP manifold uh, definable and in fact of an extremely simple form, this is a graph. Graph of F A, a definable function from an open definable subset of R to the R to Rn. So with F CP uh, definable with bounded derivatives. With bounded So this is, in some sense, the best notion of stratification that you can imagine. You cannot do simpler. I mean, you get a strata which are manifold, which are just graphs of CP-definable functions. No, this, this does not. But you, sorry. Well, um, in fact, uh, there is hope, but uh, I don't want to. Okay, and the last theorem that I want to mention is the trivialization theorem. It tells you the following, that if you take a continuous map, I do it for the continuous case. Right? You could do CP, but uh, continuous definable in your own minimal structure. Then uh, there exists a partition of Y in a finite a number of definable sets. So y is the disjoint union of yi, finite union, such that uh, in restriction to the preimage of those yi, uh, this map is trivial, is definably trivial. which means that you have f minus one of yi, you have uh, the projection by f to uh, yi, and then over yi, you can construct a trivial family, which is a product, uh, z, let's call it zi, and uh, this is a definable homeomorphism, so the preimage is just a product, and z square is a, uh, Right, so if you have a family uh, where uh, the structure map is definable, then you can trivialize it over cells. And of course, what is crucial is, is that everywhere, everything is finite. And the corollary of this uh, 
There is a finiteness, so this implies the finiteness of topological type, which was a, a property uh, for semi-algebraic sets, but it holds in this generality because of this. This means that if you look at this family and you look at the fiber, then there are finitely many, uh, if you want homotopy type, but even here, homeomorphism type. Questions about this? So it was a short survey, and all this is really elementary uh, topology, so you can find it in the very nice book by Van den Dries. He's a logician, but, uh, but everything is a general topology. So what is not general topology, or what was not at that time, is what I will explain now are examples of such interesting structures, where they, they used model theory to construct some. But uh, nowadays, in fact, everything can be done without logic. That's even better. So uh, examples of minimal structures. So uh, the first example, uh, well, we already saw it. This is RL, uh, the collection of semi-algebraic sets. So uh, what will be convenient is that in some sense, there is a dual description of definable uh, structures. I gave the definition using sets, but you could start from the function, rather than from the sets. And uh, so it would be useful for the description of the structures. So given a collection f of real functions, uh, we denote by r plus f uh, the smallest structure structure extending, well anyway you know that you will always have the semi-algebraic set, so you extend this one, and containing the graphs of those functions. Okay. So what is the example two? So here I could spend a lot of time, but I won't, don't want to do that. So uh, all this, of course, started with um, uh, people like uh, Wojciech who tried to uh, study a generalization of semi-algebraic sets, which are semi-analytic sets. So you take the same definition as semi-algebraic, except you, you put uh, real analytic functions, and now you have to be careful. Something really important happened here is that uh, the condition for a set to be semi-analytic is on every point of Rn, not on every point of the set itself. Okay? So maybe... Uh, the subset, you want that for any x in Rn, um, uh, there exists a neighborhood of that point, open, uh, such that uh, x intersected with u is of the form the set of y in u, such that f of y is equal to zero, and g1 of uh, y of y larger than zero for f g1 gk uh, real analytic. But be careful that here the condition uh, um, is that for any x in Rn, not for any x in x. So, uh, example of uh, uh, semi-analytic uh, semi, uh, semi sets, graph of real exponential, uh, the sine function, these are real analytic. 
And so you see that this structure will never be definable because of what I said, that this is a periodic function and cannot be uh, definable. And the problem is uh, axiom four. So uh, axiom one, two, three are okay. Uh, four fail. A projection of semi-analytic, even a compact semi-analytic set is uh, not semi-analytic in general. And so the solution was uh, found by uh, Wojciech and then by Gabriela Fironaka. It's to enlarge a category to what is called the sub-analytic set. So, uh, So now what you want, this is the same definition except that you want that x intersected with u is a linear projection of, so you force the axiom 4 of a bounded semi-analytic set, subset of Rn plus k, or some k larger than 0. Okay? The axiom 4 is not satisfied, projection of semi-analytic is not semi-analytic. So you add all the guys which are obtained by linear projection. But of course you have to be careful now, it's much better to have bounded because if you put unbounded then uh, terrible things happen. And now uh, if, you do, if you take these categories then it's much better in some sense. Why? Because you can prove that the complement of a sub-analytic set is sub-analytic. This is Gabriel's theorem and this is really the crux in this theory. Right now, this is not obvious at all. But this is true once you have uh, added this axiom. Um, um, but still, uh, the axiom four, you have added uh, sufficiently many sets so that now uh, projections of bounded semi analytic subsets uh, are definable in this new uh, structure. But uh, this is still not a structure, in fact, because now you can ask what, are, what about the linear projections of uh, sub-analytic sets themselves. And then what will happen is that only projections of bounded sub-analytic sets will be sub-analytic. So you still have this boundedness problem and this amount to problem of cleanness at infinity. And so you force it. So the, next, the, the second structure that will work is uh, what is called Rn. So, so now the true definition is the following. X in Rn is globally subanalytic. If, well, yes, there are many ways of saying it, but if you want, if it is subanalytic, not in Rn, but in Pn R. So you have also to look at what happens in the neighborhood at infinity. Well, and then uh, the claim is that the structure uh, constructed by a uh, globally sub set uh, is omino. And what you can prove is that this structure is the same thing as the following one. This means that you're allowed to play not with all uh, real analytic functions, but with the restricted ones. So these are the functions which are uh, coincide on, say, on a box, minus one, one to the n with a real analytic in the neighborhood of such a box, and which is zero outside. So the functions you are allowed to play with are uh, these kind of functions. You take real analytic functions, but only on compact sets. Okay. 
So for example, now uh, the graph of the real exponential is not allowed in this structure. Okay. And the fact that this is O minimal, this is essentially Gabrielov theorem. So this means that if you want to, you, you, you think in terms of Rn, but in the other chart, the chart at infinity. Okay. Another way of saying it is that you construct, there is an easy way of constructing a deformorphism of R to the N with uh, the open box minus one, one to the N. And then you ask that under this homomorphism, which is semi-algebraic, uh, the image is uh, globally subanalytic there. Okay, it's subanalytic there. Does it uh, answer your question or? You see, you, you want to understand what happens in infinity. So because you have to take care of the bounded, uh, uh, you, the unbounded sets. So what you do is that you also look at in the chart where you have replaced, you are at infinity and there you ask that you are also semi-analytic. And so you see, for example, that the exponential is not allowed there because at infinity, uh, if you put yourself in that chart, then uh, you will not get something uh, semi-analytic. Okay, so the example three is what is called Rx. Now we want to introduce, and this is, in some sense, this is uh, uh, the line of this lecture is that all this business about O minimal structure for the algebraic geometer is just a way to consider the exponential function, the real exponential function as an algebraic function. Not the complex, because this is periodic, but the real one. Um, so this structure will be the one uh, generated by the graph of the exponential function. And this is a real breakthrough, this is O minimum. And this is due to Wilkie. And to prove this, uh, there is some serious model theory at that time. And so, well, for example, uh, the function of this form, x gives x to the alpha or exponential minus one over x for x positive and alpha irrational. Uh, these are examples of two uh, definable uh, functions here. So here, really, you gain something to the, compared to the usual setting of algebraic geometry. Now you can consider those functions, they are allowed. So for the algebraic geometer, those functions are, are not nice. But in some sense, it's wrong. I mean, if you think of this function, it's perfectly natural function. I mean, it's decreasing very fast, and it's almost, I mean, it's not algebraic, but it's very tame from the point of view of topology. Okay, and so the structure I will be interested in, well, if you take two, O minimal structures, usually if you take the, the structure it generates, it will not be O minimal, of course. But here there is an exception to this uh, general rule, which is the following, that in fact, those two structures are compatible. So you can put together the globally subanalytic sets. So this is a structure generated by uh, restricted analytic functions. And the real exponential. And this is O minimum. And usually for all the applications I will mention, this is a structure we'll be interested in. So there you're allowed to play with any kind of real analytic function uh, on a compact set plus the full real exponential. Okay, so there are more examples uh, associated to Pfaffian differential equations. But uh, I won't need them, and I don't want to spend too much time on this. So I guess I'm very late, but let me see. So this was a short panorama of uh, those structures. Uh. Well, there, there, this is a true theorem. I, mean, I don't really have time to, to enter it. I mean, I shouldn't mention this, this, there are names. That, but <laughs> so this is a result of Van den Dries and Miller. Uh, what I should say is that nowadays, I mean, all these functions are, all these, you can now give complete proof of those results using some kind of generalized Weierstrass preparation theorem. So people doing a real algebraic geometry or singularities 
like Lyon or these kind of people, uh, they, they, they now have entire proof of this. Okay, I'm so late that uh, it's really bad. Um, maybe I can, can I take five more minutes? Yes, thank you. <laughs> because I want to start about applications. So uh, today I will do at least the, f uh, the first one. So applications. So there will be two kinds of applications. Uh, the first one will be uh, about uh, complex analysis. And the second one will be about diaphantine geometry. And then I will explain uh, that you can apply this to uh, uh, transcendence, functional transcendence question. So I guess I will have to recalibrate all this. But let me at, at least uh, today pre present uh, comp the, the application to uh, Complex, uh, complex analysis. So the first thing is that I should mention before I go is that, and I will not write it, is that you can globalize the notion that I define on Rn and define the notion of S-definable manifolds. So this will just be a manifold with a finite atlas of charts such that the charts are definable, the function defining the charts are definable, and the change of coordinates are definable. In your minimal structure, so this is no problem. So uh, let me go to uh, this. And uh, now, uh, uh, the motto is that uh, uh, definable structures are not compatible with the, the, the pathologies of complex analysis. So this is, in some sense, this is your dreamland. Because, so, uh, let me explain by giving you what happened in dimension one. This is the following lemma, is that if you have a map, a holomorphic map, from the uh, punctured uh, disk, to C, suppose it is holomorphic and definable in some minimal structure. By this, I mean that I think, of course, this guy has been R2, because this is real geometry. Okay? So I have two completely separate properties. On one hand, this is O minimal, definable in some minimal structure from that point of view, but also holomorphic for the complex structure. Then the claim is that. Zero is not an essential singularity. You just get neuromorphic stuff. It's not an essential singularity of F. In other words, this map is neuromorphic. And uh, the proof is uh, nice. Non-trivial, but nice. So proof uh, by contradiction. So assume uh, zero is an essential singularity. Then you apply the great Picard theorem. Uh, it tells you that if you look at the graph, then uh, this is contained in the uh, boundary of the graph. Okay. But uh, now the dimension of this thing this implies that the dimension of uh, this boundary uh, is two. Uh, this is also the dimension of the graph. And so uh, this is a contradiction to the fact that this set should be definable. Well, of course, this is a non-trivial uh, theorem, but, uh, but still. So uh, in higher dimension, to motivate, uh, in higher dimension, the following theorem uh, is the real of the crux for understanding extension of an analytic set. So this is Ramerschein theorem. Tells you the following that uh, suppose you start from a C analytic a manifold S, and out of it you extract a C analytic subset. And now you suppose that uh, uh, in this difference you have X, which is also C analytic. And for simplicity, let's just assume that it is irreducible. 
Now the question that you can ask in this situation that happens all the time is you want to study the closure of X in X, in S. Okay. And then uh, the Remerschneid theorem tells you that if uh, the dimension uh, of a C of X is strictly larger than the dimension of E, then in fact, uh, X bar is C analytic. And of the same dimension as X. In other words, you can propagate uh, analyticity in taking the closure. If you have the right condition on the dimension, this guy has to be much big, uh, to be bigger, strictly dimension strictly larger than the set that you are removing. Right, and uh, to see that this is really a needed condition, just a counter example, a non example. Take the graph of uh, exponential 1 over z. And c2 minus z is equal to 0. Right, so here this set is dimension 1, and this set is dimension 1, and of course it does not extend because it oscillates very fast, close to 0. So this condition, this condition seems to be really needed and in some sense optimal. Uh, but uh, the claim now is that this condition, uh, the condition dimension x larger than dimension c of e uh, has to be understood as being a tameness assumption. E is a tameness, a kind of tameness assumption. In the following sense, so uh, now the main theorem and this theorem I will use tomorrow is the following result of uh, Peter Zill and Starchenko, which are the experts in this kind of application of O minimality to complex analysis. So you put yourself exactly in the same situation, but now, uh, so everything is complex analytic, but now you assume that this guy is uh, definable. So as before, definable means definable in some O minimal structure, okay? And uh, you suppose that this guy is definable. This guy does not have to be. And then the claim is that if you take the closure in S, uh, this is still complex analytic. And uh, same conclusion. Yes. So, um, so all these guys are C analytic. So as before, referring only to the first graph. So uh, the E, I no, only know that this is C analytic. There is no assumption on E. Uh, those ones are complex analytic and definable. And the corollary of this is that you have an affine version of uh, Chow theorem. The corollary, still due to Petersen and Starchenko. This is an O minimal version of Chow. Let's use that. Suppose that you have S, which is a complex quasi projective. For example, C to the N. And you have X, which is a complex analytic and definable in some O minimal structure. Then X is algebraic. Right? And uh, well, this is the same, in the same way as from Remerschein theorem, you can prove the usual Chow theorem, because this is always an extension problem. So let me, then in this case, you get, let me just give the proof. Well, 
to put s in s bar uh, with s bar minus s. S bar is smooth, and uh, this is strictly normal crossing. S bar smooth. Well, now s bar is projective manifold, so uh, it is definable even in R alg as any projective manifold. Now, uh, by the theorem, uh, I get that x bar inside s bar uh, is C analytic. But then I apply usual chow. Which means that x bar is algebraic, and I'm done. Just notice, I want, would like to mention that this result is quite recent. I forgot the, the date, but it's after 2000. And, but there was a result of Fortuna and uh, Wojciechowicz saying exactly the same, same thing in, uh, in, the complex, in, the, in the characterization using semi-algebraic geometry, telling you that suppose that S is C to the N, and you take uh, a complex uh, analytic subset, then it is algebraic if and only if it is uh, semi real semi-algebraic. Okay. Uh, well, uh, tomorrow I will show you how, how we can apply this uh, for point some algebraicity result. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm late. I will stop here for today. <laughs>